like to uh, welcome everyone um, to the Connect, Communicate, Cultivate webinar, Eight Steps for Cultivating Relationships with Donors. Uh, today's webinar is in conjunction with Candid. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to cover some you know, housekeeping items, and then we'll get into our uh, fundraising presentation, leave a little time at the end for Q&A, and then we just have some few short announcements from our strategic philanthropy team. Our housekeeping items, and please keep your mics muted when you're not speaking. Uh, post any questions in, in the chat box or any you know comments, dialogues as well. I think we we you know definitely welcome a nice discussion in, in the chat box throughout the presentation. Uh, reminder the recording of the webinar and a copy of the presentation slides will be emailed out to you. And you're generally a couple days after the presentation. And we also will post this information on salmonwealthcares.org will be on our resources page. So feel free to refer back to the email or go online to our salmonwellcares.org um, for copies of today's presentation. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Candid. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're getting started uh, now, it looks like. Um, so while we're getting set up, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat, um, let us know your name and your organization. That way everyone can see who's here. That would be great. And so welcome to eight steps for cultivating relationships with individual donors. This is part one. We know we have part two on June 15th, I believe. Yes, June 15th. So this will be part one. So my name is Laura Bergman. I am the programs assistant for Candid West and uh, my pronouns are she and her. I work closely with Christy, Krista Berry Ortega and she's our programs manager for the West. Um, she is amazing and you'll love her. So she'll be doing the presentation and I'll be helping her out today. And her pronouns are she and her. So first, we're going to do a quick grounding exercise just to get us all here, ready to learn, excited about the next uh, little while. So my question to you all is, um, what are three things that you are grateful for? And I'd like you to put them in the chat. Um, it can be anything as simple as I'm grateful for my cat purring to I'm grateful that I have a job or it could be several of those things. So just three things that you are grateful for today. We're going to start off with that. Oh, I love it. My golden retrievers, my health, my friends. Oh, indeed. Oops, they're going too fast. Can you read any of those, Krista, or is it just... <laughs> I can read some of them as they're coming in. My husband, my job, my health. Yeah. Family, oh, meaningful work, the mountains. Oh, here we go. Yes, now I can see it. <laughs> Thank you. A lot of family. It's funny, I wrote down my family too. So we must all have some shared values around family. And I was thinking my my dogs, my family, not necessarily in that order. <laughs> my dogs. <laughs> My family and certainly my job. I'm, I love my job, so that helps a lot. So that I feel healthy, that I have a passion for life, and that there's good wine. Yes, I'm with you. Yes, Heidi. I share that value. Oh, that's Ruth. Um, Heidi says my great coworkers, my pets, and all our webinar participants. Yay! That's Yay! Awesome. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. So yes, we're grateful for a lot of things. It's just important to uh, to spend one minute on that before we get started, given um, what the crazy world that we live in today. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about Candid, your host for today's training. For those of you who don't uh, necessarily know us yet, um, we were founded in, in uh, 2019 when Foundation Center and GuideStar merged forces and became our own 501c3 nonprofit. And every year, millions of nonprofits spend trillions of dollars around the world. Candid finds out where that money comes from, where it goes, and most importantly, why it matters. We do this through research, 
through collaboration, through training, and we'd like to say Candid connects people who want to change the world to the resources they need to do it. Candid's data tools on nonprofits, foundations, and grants are actually the most comprehensive in the world. So we, I will drop a, a, a link in the chat in case you want to know more about our offerings, our trainings. Um, a lot of you have done that already, but I'll let you know. Put it in the chat. So thank you so much for being part of Candid's learning community. We know it's a really challenging time for many folks. Um, at Candid, we've shifted our key learning opportunities to a virtual format like this one. And you can check them all out at Candid Learning Online. We've also invested in providing the social sector with resources on today's pressing issues. We have a resource uh, landing page for COVID-19. And we also have one for racial equity resources. So we'll drop those in the chat up. as soon as I'm done. I'll put those in there. So we are recording today's presentation. Um, you'll all get a copy uh, soon. I, I would think in a couple of days. Um, and we will have not just the recording, but we'll also be emailing you the deck. And whatever resources we talk about today, all the links, we'll be sending you those as well. So don't feel like you have to take notes on all that. So today's agenda, uh, we're going to do a warm up, which um, is coming right up. And or maybe we've done it. <laughs> Not sure. And then we'll do an introduction to cog selling and eight steps. That'll be Krista. Um, and then we'll do a case study just to bring it home. So today's learning outcomes after today, you should be able to explain how selling your cause is part of fundraising in the social sector. You should be able to make the case for the value of donor relationships for fundraising success. You will be able to assess your circles of influence to identify prospective new donors, and you'll be you'll have a draft of a plan to improve relationships with your existing donors. So with that, uh, we will do a quick group or group share in chat. This will be our warm up. What is your level of experience with today's workshop topic? So how experienced are you in this? Are you very experienced, experienced, somewhat experienced, or completely new to this topic? I'll give you a minute to just put that into the chat. New to all, very experienced, and somewhat. We have some of everything, Krista. Oh, good. Okay, well, we're counting on our very experience to also be a part of this conversation and share your experience with the group as well. Yeah, so we really do have a, a mixed bag. We have a, we have every single type. We have very experienced somewhat and completely new and advanced. So this will be great. We'll learn. This will be great. Exactly. That's exactly it. Thank you so much, Laura, for that great welcome. And yes, that's exactly it. We want to learn from each other. Laura and I have a lot of experience in fundraising. Let's not add the years right now, but we've both been development directors and executive directors leading fundraising for mostly small organizations, although we both have some experience working for larger organizations. I've been a philanthropy consultant. Laura sits as the president and chair of a board right now, an arts organization in the Bay Area helping with fundraising. So we've got a lot of experience between the two of us to help you with this topic. And yet we recognize that we're not doing it like you are right now. So we want to hear what's working, what your questions are, and, and, and from those that are experienced, your experience today and how that might be different today, or what are those best practices that have worked through many different uh, economies or times or, or um, cycles in fundraising. So I think, Everyone that's in this room is exactly what we need to have a really robust discussion about individual giving. I also wanted to add that um, Laura covered our amazing learning objectives. We're going to talk about um, the last one mostly. We're only going to cover half of the content today. We're going to come back next week and finish the content and, and leave you with a plan on how to cultivate your existing donors before you leave next week. So I'm putting the plug in to make sure you come next week um, to get the second part of this exciting um, topic and workshop. 
So I love to just start with, especially when we're talking about individual giving this word philanthropy, we use it a lot. The team from San Manuel, it's in their titles. Um, and it's always a good way to kind of ground ourselves um, as we've been doing and like what we're talking about. This is a, a definition of philanthropy, empowering people to follow their passions, to make a greater impact on society. And so let's just note that that doesn't specifically talk about financials. So sometimes when we think of the word philanthropy, we, we might think about money, which money is a part of it, of course, but it's really about following passions to make an impact and, and getting people engaged and involved. So these are some other words that we use to kind of talk about the act of philanthropy in the bottom, generosity, humanitarianism, altruism, brotherly love, charitableness, bountifulness, compassion. So I love to just remind us all that working in the space that we all work, doing this hard work, this is hard work. Fundraising and being a part of the philanthropic process, especially in the U.S., is hard work. So first, thank you. My gratitude is also to all of you. Thanking you for doing the work that you're doing in our community because I know it's making it stronger. And also the act of A, doing what we're doing right now, talking about it, but also B, like being a part of your organization and working in it, you are engaged in philanthropy. And sometimes we have to rethink the bias we may have when we think of philanthropist, the person that we're cultivating and see ourselves in that word and see ourselves as an expert in what will motivate folks to follow their passions to make a difference and an impact on society. When we can really connect ourselves to this work, it helps us then continue to have this conversation that we're going to have about how to engage donors in your work and ultimately ask them for money too. <laughs> so before I continue and getting down to kind of some of the details, we're going to keep it active in the chat. And I really want to know what, what motivated you to come today? We've got a mix of experience here. Why did you come to the, today's workshop and, and what would you like to take away after this two part series so that we can really um, spend our time on meeting your real time goals today? So go ahead and let us know what motivated you to come today. What would you like to take away from this workshop? Are we getting any responses, Laura? Oh, I see them coming in. Thank you all for go. being active. Love to learn more and stay on top of trends. Yes, so do we. Uh, curious about Candid's programs. Wonderful. Um, and I did put those links in the chat earlier, so you can scroll up and get on those if you'd like to, if you'd like to learn more. Uh, we just lost our philanthropy director and are looking to fill the position, but in the meantime, I need to help out. So this was a great opportunity. Great. Wonderful. We need to learn how to find donors for tribal causes. Great. Mm. And learning how to help our organization, learn to work more effectively, um, have attended other candid webinars and always leave with new skills. Well, we love to hear that. Uh, yes, we'll tell our bosses that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and last one, encouragement and to learn. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. That's super helpful. I am confident with that with our learning objectives and everyone we have on today that we can meet those needs. I've also built in time for questions. So as we go, that's exactly what Laura is going to do. Please ask your questions. Laura is skilled at interrupting me and pausing me to make sure that <laughs> we get your questions answered as we go along. We want to keep this engaging for you. Um, and with you, and like I said, it'll also help inform us the questions that you're asking and how we're really going to design next week's second parter. I like to really give some context when we're talking about individual donors specifically today on like the, the sector and the, and the data that, that we're really working with. This is um, a report that I'm sure many of you are aware of. If you're not, it's called Giving USA, and it comes out every June, so actually I need to actually write this down. I'm about, I need to remember to register for our local, I'm in San Diego, the local AFP um, Giving USA, I'm writing it down right now, um, reveal because the new data for 2020 is gonna come out soon and I can't wait to share all of this with you 
and everyone else on what last year looked like, but we are always are kind of a year behind and understanding where contributions come from in the US. The point that I want to make here is this pie chart has a lot of things going on, but the kind of right hand side of this graphic is our individual givers and it's it represents 69% of all contributions in 2019 to our sector. That's a lot folks that's over 300 billion dollars okay out of you can see the big pot it's a majority of the the, the financial uh, contributions coming into our sector and um this has really looked like this for at least 20 years okay it's it's ebbed and flown it's gone from around 71 percent down to 69 was a little lower in 2019 and we're already seeing early reports that 2020 grew because folks wanted to give to really important causes, obviously, like the pandemic and the coronavirus, but also racial equity and giving to um, BIPOC led and BIPOC for organizations has also grown. So that's why the, the links that uh, Laura just dropped in the chat for you are um, really exciting and they're up to date. Actually, Laura, I just saw the news this morning. I can't remember the foundation right now. I think it's MasterCard. Um, just committed billions of dollars to help vaccine roll out in Africa. And I'm sorry, I don't have all the details, but that's the type of stuff that just happened this morning that will be up to date on our coronavirus page to show you what's happening in this space. The thing to point out here is that often we think of corporations and foundations as like our lead source of income. And you can see that if we look at the data nationwide, it's not as much as what individuals are giving. So this is a perfect opportunity for you to really go back. Maybe that's like homework number one for this week is go back. And if you don't know the percentages of how your organization revenue breaks down, go and look at it and really see if you're not around 69 to 70% of individual revenue from your organization that matches this, well, then my quick advice to you is that is a huge opportunity for you to grow your revenue now more than ever um, and bring in new individuals and start cultivating as this workshop describes new individuals to give to your organization. A little more context too on what we're working within. Um, 1.6 million dollars um, from churches to food banks, cultural centers. Um, there's more than one what's that number? 1.5 tax exempt 501c3 organizations. Honestly, this is probably up to date. Our, one of our uh, greatest tools at Candid is GuideStar. So you can go on GuideStar and see like how many organizations are there. This is talking about there's at least 1.6 million nonprofits out there that I don't want to say you're competing against because that's not the point, but you want to stand out. You really want to like make sure that when you are writing a grant proposal or you're talking to individual donors that you really know why you need the money and that your organization stands out. And the other kind of point to just like understand what world we're working in is we're also as a sector 10% of the workforce, which is huge. We're a big part of the economy. And it's a great, we want to continue to see folks staying in this field and growing the economy, but it's providing jobs and employment opportunities for at least 10% of the nation's population. So this is a big and an important conversation to have with donors. We want everyone in, in especially the US to really understand the important impact of the nonprofit sector and how that they can get involved, right? Maybe recruit more folks, but also it's a great entry way to get people involved in volunteering as well, to really understand what an impact we make on this nation's economy. Did we have any questions coming in, Laura? I see a little activity in chat and I keep missing them. Oh, uh, nope. Just uh, one person mentioned the the uh, MasterCard uh, uh, amount that you mentioned earlier is 1.3 billion. Yes, and thank you. Put a link into GuideStar into the chat. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yes, it was MasterCard. Okay, I read it quickly before I got on this morning. One, and that's a lot. That's a lot of money, folks. It's out there, and people are are stepping up, like MasterCard and other um, individual philanthropists, to really help. So we gave you a heads up that we're going to give you this kind of cause selling model. And I wanted to kind of get this part out of the way that like we all sell, 
Okay. So let's not feel uncomfortable with it. And a lot of times, and we hear this all the time from folks when they're like, oh, I don't really want to ask people for money. It's uncomfortable. Like, it's just not what I'm good at. And I don't want to sell the organization. But I want you to know that you already have the skills. It doesn't have to be that kind of icky car sales person uh, experience that we do it every day. We're, we're, we're kind of pitching ourselves when we're at an interview, right? We're sharing um, the work that we do when we're at a family picnic or barbecue and explaining the work that we do and getting other folks involved. So in any position and in any career from, as this slide says, parents to scientists and everyone in between, we're selling every day. So you wanna create your own kind of brand for what sales can be and for me, to sell a cause, to share and advocate for a cause is some of the best sales work um, that I've ever done. And for those that are parents, I'm not, so I can't relate to that example, but I am a, a really involved auntie. Actually, I can't wait to see my nieces um, this weekend after a very long, over a year of not seeing them. I'm sure there's plenty of moments when you're selling healthy food or time to go to bed or um, important to move your body. Um, so think really reframing what selling is, is an important takeaway that we're, we'd like to leave you with today that it doesn't have to be negative. There's all these nonprofits in this, all this money, billions of dollars that are going into our sector and individuals really want to hear from you. They want you to sell their cause to them so they can figure out how they can help. So some qualities of some top performing funder, fundraisers, I'm sure we have it in the room, but something to think about as you grow your career is this exchange for information rather than the hard sell, like I was just talking about. We, it, again, I think it's just stereotyped what sales is often, and it's an exchange of information. It's listening and it's sharing based on what folks are interested in. It's knowing when to close and we don't, again, we're not meaning icky. It's just like when people want to give to your cause and you've already had this experience, you, you need to ask them. <laughs> um, I've worked with so many donors over the years and as a consultant, I had the opportunity in a lot of consulting work, we get to interview donors so that we can make recommendations for organizations. And time and time again, they don't stay involved because they haven't been asked. And so it starts at a minimal level of asking someone for $10, but it, it, it also grows when it's really time to ask someone for a million dollars. So it's really knowing and being aware of when to close. And we're going to give you some tips on that. Advocating for donors. Ultimately, the best donors are the ones that share your values. That's why we did this wonderful gratitude exercise early in the uh, workshop. Thanks to Laura. And so advocating for your donors, you're all in it for the same ultimate cause. There might be some difference, um, obviously, in diversity and who you all are, but advocating for your donors and they're going to advocate for you. Another top quality of a, um, a great fundraiser is providing value to your donors. It's not just an ATM, right? Ideally, if you have those kind of relationships already, it's a perfect opportunity to go back and be like, have I followed up with some other communications about what the impact of their gift is in between asking them again? So really providing value for them to get involved in. There are causes that I care about, and I know that if I get involved, I'm also going to meet other folks that care about those causes, and that's a lot of the reason that I donate is because I want to be a part of a community that cares about certain things. Um, and so it goes beyond just my, my monetary gift, right? There's opportunities to potentially volunteer and um, to receive more engagement and communications from the organizations. Great fundraisers are trusted within their organization, but also in their, in their sector as a whole. We're working in this virtual wor world where in the organization kind of can feel a little weird. Um, and if you guys are uh, heading back to the office, I'd love to know in the chat as well, because I know we're we're in a transition time where some of our colleagues are headed back to an office as well. So within your organization and within your, um, you know, your professional circles. So trust is really important in this work and engaging in positive relationship building behaviors, as I said, both internally and externally. So when Laura and I talk to fundraisers, just like you, we urge you to see every opportunity, including these workshops, as an opportunity to practice building relationships. 
So we give you activities and we give you homework and um, it, it, it ultimately lay, lays on you, right? There's the, there's the education that you're going to get and the skills that we're going to share, but then it's about practicing it and really utilizing every opportunity to um, develop stronger relationships. So that's through volunteering, that's through um, relationships with friends and family, and that's through relationships with your colleagues. Um, if you're not practicing fundraising skills internal, then it might be harder to then all of a sudden practice it with an external donor. So thinking about, do you have giving campaigns internal to your organization? Are you all in, are you in involving non-fundraising staff in your fundraising planning and um, programming? So really uh, starting internal to help you really um, practice and grow those, those Chris, fundraising we, skills. Yeah, oh, some, sorry. Before you move on, we have some great comments in the chat. Um, get your threshold issues in place. This is great advice. Current 990s, website up to date, register with GuideStar. This is what donors look at right away. Yes, exactly, Stephen. And then from yes. Alberto, I also think great fundraisers know a lot about how the organization operates as a whole. They know the budget, employees, programs, board, et cetera. Great advice. Thank you. Yes, share more. Thank you for pausing me. Share more in the chat on what else you think makes a great fundraiser. I completely agree that a, a fundraiser should really um, understand the organization and be able to share aspects of all of the organization, like you said, knowing the financials. But also, a fundraiser is a great uh, because they're great relationship builders. They're they're great at um, facilitating when yes, they probably could talk about it, but maybe someone else should be talking about a certain area of the organization as well. And because you have all these great internal relationships, you know that you can ask your CPA or your program director or your when to ask even your CEO to kind of show up and share more because you're you're using all of your expertise um, to to make sure that you're you're again telling the story the best. So you don't have to yes, you're the expert and also you don't always have to be the only one talking all the time as a great fundraiser. You can really pull in other expertise. I'm seeing some more uh, qualities of great fundraisers coming into the chat too, Laura, yes. Uh, no, oh, I see. What is a 990? <laughs> Hopefully you again. file them uh, or someone in your organization files them to, with the IRS every year. <laughs> yeah, that's any, I hope you all have a way of taking notes. There's so many different ways of taking notes. I'm a post-it person myself, so I write post-it notes down, but find a, a some way, a, a document to take notes and that's a perfect kind of homework next step. Um, you can look up your 990 in, in many different ways, but the guide the GuideStar profile that Laura and other folks have been talking about is kind of a great one-stop shop to see what your organization's um, putting out there and to learn more about your tax documents, which are really important, not just to foundation and corporate funders, but individual donors are using those to make decisions on how they're, they're giving. And one so the more important great piece of advice, um, have your beneficiaries share with donors. Yes. Absolutely. Great advice. So you're, you're engaging beneficiaries. You all know that you want to make sure that there's privacy and you're not like, you know, putting them in a weird position, but you, you're going to do that very inclusively um, with your, your beneficiaries in and, um, and make it, make sure it, it's equitable for all, but absolutely telling the stories or ut utilizing. Um, I think we were talking about video as a great way to communicate stories these days because we're not all coming together in person as much. So using um, your beneficiaries to really demonstrate the impact um, in a strategic way is so important. Thank you for sharing. So the important piece here to keep in mind is, especially when we're engaging with individuals at any level, to focus on the relationship, not just the money, okay? Um, and I would say that is true. I like teaching about individual giving because I think these principles apply for how you get uh, engaged with corporations, with foundations, with real any funders, if you think about it, because there's a person reading your grant proposal. Maybe in the future with AI, it'll be a computer system where it'll spit out like, oh, fund this person 50,000 because they wrote this great thing. But for now, it's mostly humans that are reading your proposals. So there's still 
ways to engage and focus on the relationship, but just really following the different guidelines depending on who your funder is. So yes, of course we have to ask for money, but if the relationship is there, you'll know that when the timing is right and folks won't just feel like you're just coming to them for an, as an ATM, that there's really a way that they can engage. And that's ultimately when you see larger, longer uh, gifts coming in. Oh, this slide is blank. There we go. So we're going to talk to you about this model that we love. I've been working with cause selling for um, many years, and I'm excited to still be able to teach you these principles. It's a relationship based program for nonprofit fundraising, and it involves 8 steps. So we're going to go over 4 of them today and the final 4 next week. Really what it does and the reason I love it is because it uses entrepreneurial business development tactics. So again, we're getting comfortable with the word selling and we're doing it in a really smart um, relationship based way and it helps fundraisers build those better relationships. And ultimately what's important, especially for um, fundraising now more than ever is building uh, prospect pipelines. So you may be okay with your funding today. But we're in a very uncertain time right now. And if you're okay today, good for you. Um, time to be thinking about next year and the next few years and start cultivating that pipeline of new funders to fund your work so that you can sustain. So we see cause selling as, as a solution. Sometimes the traditional fundraising mes message cycle can lead to unsure funding and really kind of scrambling for dollars. And if you're there, it's okay. This has been a really hard year, but we wanna get you out of that kind of scrambling for dollars and being more strategic with your fundraising. So a lot of times that sounds like, have you heard we need money? We need money, give us money. Ah! <laughs> I added the ah, um, that's not on the slide, but you know what I mean? It feels like that and, and funders are feeling like that. And if you're asking anyone to invest in something like that, it doesn't necessarily feel stable or is it a good investment? Think about you. Do you want to invest in something that's in that kind of critical urgent situation? So the cause selling message cycle really leads to honest and heartfelt communication and ultimately when put in place and invested in and ensures long-term success. So it really starts with here's what we do, here's that uh, how, how that affects you. Please support our cause through a donation. Here's what your support accomplished. Okay, it's that final bringing them in and then sharing back out that keeps people really engaged. I know you all are doing great things around this. Um, so continue to share stories in, in the chat as well on like, you know, what has worked and, and what hasn't for you. Here's another kind of image of traditional fundraising sometimes versus this cause selling or any other model that you're, you're using that's really based on relationships is the, the kind of graph on the left is, um, the closing becomes really hard. It's about 40% of your time because you're, um, telling and qualifying and presenting and on the other side. You're using more time in the beginning to build trust, build rapport and ask questions. So therefore, all of those steps in the investment of time up front and building the relationship in cause selling makes the ask much easier and less time. Ultimately, really great, um, especially major donor um, relationship building. They're basically asking you <laughs> um, to ask them how much you need. Um, when when all of this kind of on the right trust and rapport and relationship building and listening and and questioning is the majority of your time. You can already see, though, you're like, oh, my gosh, well, somebody just lost someone that's been doing all of this. It It is time. Of course it is. Um, that's the hardest part. This is not a simple solution. This isn't quick you know, money to support your cause. This is building champions and. Um, you know, supporters and advocates to your cause that will last a long time. So this 40, 30, you know, bulk of the time to develop those relationships is so worth it. And, you know, when you have those relationships, you can see how how truly worth it it is. I've heard so many great stories over the last year for organizations that have invested in professional 
uh, fundraisers with those qualities that we were just talking about that have invested in a team that they're having donors that in addition to their regular gift are giving, you know, extra million dollars, extra $200,000, introducing them to new funders in a time of crisis because they're so engaged, they're going to pull out those kind of rainy day funds to help an organization that they care that much about. So good stories are happening and it's because of that building trust and rapport. So the cost selling cycle has um, three phases and they're kind of color coded here. The first phase is prospecting and pre-approach. The second phase includes, includes approach, uh, approach needs discovery and presentation through handling objections. And finally, uh, phase three is the ask and stewardship. So we're gonna get through um, the first half today, but I want you to just note that seven is the ask. So we're not talking about asking anybody for money yet, okay? If, if that's any anxiety that you may have or an area that you're like, I'm stepping into this and I don't know how to ask people, that's okay. Because there's so much more relationship building that comes before asking. And or if you're doing a campaign, a lot of planning on, you know, knowing who your donors are to even know what to ask for, um, even if it's an email campaign. So um, there's, again, it, with eight steps, the ask is seven. A lot of work needs to go up front um, to really make sure that you have a great, great relationship and that you know what to ask for. So question, why do people give? Share with us. Why do you give? Why do you think others are giving to your organization? What are the stories you've heard? And while we're waiting for people to put that in, oh, did somebody speak? Hi, Alberto, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, I was going to share, Chris, that, that, you know, with all of our partners yesterday, I got a, a call from, um, you know, from a group, you know, answered the phone, you know, and I was like, hi, my name's so-and-so, can you sponsor our dinner? And, and. I was just confused the whole time. Uh, it was kind of like a cold call and I'm familiar with the group and so on. And, and, I, and, and my immediate recommendation was like, well, you should have the person that you, we work with your organization call us, you know, because that's who we work with commonly. They're like, well, can you still support our, our, our event? Right. And the whole time it was just very confusing. And, you know, I agree with this, you know, step number seven, right. As far as the ask that come, you know, first. You know, you, we got to talk first and, you know, make the connection and so on. So this is spot on. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that example. I want those kind of real time examples. Yeah, it feels weird when it's all of a sudden out of the blue and you're like, I don't have this relationship. And not that you are not interested, but um, to me, the timing of that ask was was off. And, and yeah. I think you gave them some nice advice, but not everyone would take that time. Mm hmm. Right, and I like Alberto what you said in the chat about cause selling. It's building trust between the funder and the grantee, which is crucial. And in your in your case, they weren't really building the trust; they were sort of skipping a step. It seems like um, we have a few other answers in the chat. I give because it's an organization that changed my life and gave me so much as a child. That's wonderful. Beautiful. Uh, Diane says because the donors have empathy with and for our recipients. That's the benefit hmm. phrase we were talking about. Um, we have another one passionate about the work that the nonprofit is doing. And uh, let's see, there's a personal connection or passion for the mission. And then the last one is individual giving is about relationships. Yes, that's right. Yes, I love it. And if you haven't necessarily, um, you know, given even I'm talking about like $10 here to someone else's cause. Like I, I'm thinking of an opportunity where like someone's running a race and they ask me to give $10. Well, I, I, I might not even be connected to that cause. I'm doing it because it's my friend and it's important to my friend. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason that I've given or gotten involved and have volunteered at things like that, because it, again, it's not my personal story, but I know it's important to someone that that is important to me. Um, some other reasons why people give, tell us. Maybe they're, do some people give because they're trying to get some tax benefits, maybe? It happens, let's be real. Connections to the cause, right? People start foundations to do good work and to also, if they've made a bunch of money, it's a perfect opportunity to put it in, you know, to a foundation or a, a donor fund 
um, avoid taxes on it and do good with it. So it doesn't always have to feel icky for that motivation. That's another reason why we have this amazing opportunity in this sector. If you come into a bunch of money, there's donor advised funds that you can put it in and do something really good with. And I want, I want to, I'm saying that because also some of us have really struggled over the last year and some professions and some folks have not. Some folks have done very well financially in this challenging, crazy year, as hard as that is to even think about. So we have to really kind of reframe and understand what's really going on out there so that we can make sure that we're not putting our own financial experiences on others. If they've made some money and, and they want to do something good with it and we're giving them that opportunity, then um, everyone wins. It's a win-win. I see some more reasons why people give. Breast cancer walks and other events like this. Yes, got friends asking friends. It is such an effective tool and that's how small donations can really add up quickly, right? Are these kind of, they're called peer-to-peer -peer campaigns and we can do them online just as easily as we're able to do in person. What else is in that chat, Laura? Uh, let's see. We also have, I believe the work and or the person and the, what, sorry, believe in the work the person slash organization is doing. Um, people give because of disaster, for example, the American Red Cross. Um, love and it. paying it forward, creating a legacy for the future. I love that. Love all of these reasons, folks. They're all so important. And yet at the same time, you can see that we all have a different um, relationship to it. While they're all yes, our answer to why people give or why we give is unique because you're unique and we're all unique and our, our lives change. Um, you know, my experience with my, you know, grandfather might be something that is really important to me, but then I move into something new as my life changes and I have new interests. So we all change just like um, <laughs> anyone would grow and change. So our answer may shift over time. And it's, this is another really important reason why developing relationships is so critical. And it goes for foundations too. I, I We have these um, meetings with folks with some, some of our other partners and I'm like, they're like, well, yeah, the last time um, I looked at that foundation two years ago, they weren't giving to our work. And I'm like, well, that was two years ago, right? I mean, things have changed again, especially now we're seeing foundations and corporate funders shifting their funding um, priorities to help. So always making sure that you're taking and dedicating that time to, to ask and do the research to see what folks are giving to is so important for your work. Don't, don't leave them off the list just because they weren't interested two years ago. It can change. And a very good point by Stephen. People have the desire because of emotional reasons, but they decide for rational reasons. You have to have both. Love it. And you, it was a perfect well segue to this slide. Stephen, thank you so much for contributing because um, it's so important to hear peer um, experiences as well, but really the number one reason that a donor decides to give to a nonprofit is because they were asked folks. Not everyone is going to have a passion and take it upon themselves to go and do the research and to find it. So it's really important for organizations to stay top of mind, especially to to donors and individuals that do have a connection to the mission. Because I'm going to tell you, I get a lot of emails every day. I'm on a lot of newsletters and I'm sure I'm getting asked and, and told about work in a, in a lot of different ways. So what are those you know campaigns and organizations that are really going to stay out and kind of motivate me? Um, I can tell you from my email boxes these days, I'm about to set up another personal email box because mine are so full, that um, if it's just one email, I miss it. So asking and engaging and developing a relationship has to be a regular practice, okay? So yes, there's a lot of, a lot of reasons why a donor decides to give, but asking is an important key and they have told us time and time again that that's important to them. They wanna be asked at the right time, of course, Alberto. So let's get into our steps. Um, step one, and we're going to kind of use this graphic to go through is prospecting and it's really looking for and searching and like knowing who those donors are. Some of them, you know, and this is always, yes, of course, prospecting, we call it acquisition where you get new donors and you always want to have a plan for how you're bringing new 
prospective folks in, okay? But that time from a new donor, as we can see the cycle and from Alberto's example, is it takes a while to cultivate. So you wanna have different types of prospecting lists and sometimes they can come right from your own list of supporters. So here are some, I'm gonna close this chat so I can see the own slide. Here are 10 methods of prospecting that I want to leave you with. And we do have a handout, Laura, after I go through these two slides, okay, to take with you. And again, you're gonna get a copy of this deck as well. Referrals, huge, especially when we're talking about relationships. Um, this could come from the board. Um, this could come from, like we said, of friends of an organization, but referrals are such a huge prospecting tool that frankly, I don't see enough of us um, having enough strategy meetings around leveraging referrals. Um, we we can't wait for them to happen. We have to like actively um, use referrals as an opportunity and have a system for what we do with them. Circles of influence, we're gonna do an activity next on how to grow your circle of influence. We all have one. Um, and it's, it's a little weird in this kind of more uh, hybrid an online environment, but I'm seeing a lot of really creative and innovative ways to grow circles of influence and to um, steward circles of influence. So we'll talk about that in a bit. But it's basically who you know, right? And so your board knows someone and every staff person knows someone and they have their circle. Event prospecting, also really important. Um, let me know in the chat, are you doing virtual events? Have you shifted them? I'm seeing a lot of, um, I'm, I'm seeing a lot more kind of stewardship, like non fundraising virtual events to get new folks involved. And I'll tell you this quick story. My friend here in San Diego, he is on a board. Um, he works in the sector, but you know, we all serve in boards in different ways as another part of our, um, you know, commitment to the sector. And so he, part of his board responsibility, they're doing virtual tours of the organization. They basically uh, provide homes to folks that need homes. So we did a virtual tour and he invited all of his colleagues and friends. And uh, it was kind of a happy hour thing. We could bring our own you know, drink, which was he knew was kind of important for me after hours. Um, so he knew who he was inviting. And we got to see a virtual tour and learn more about the organization. And no one asked me for money. No one. They followed up and asked how I might like to get involved. Um, but it was really, I went to support my friend and to learn more. And it was such a great model on bringing new uh, potential prospects in. I'm probably not the fit, but for 20 people, they might get about three people that want to get more involved. So it's a great tool. And also any kind of fundraising event should also have kind of a prospecting follow-up component where you have your key supporters that are coming and they're inviting guests. So, yeah. in fact, Stephen mentions in the chat, events aren't worth anything unless you follow through with prospecting. Exactly. And we always get so tired after the event. I did events for so many years. It's actually how I grew my fundraising career because I was doing events and then I started doing fundraising events. And then I'm like, oh, I want to do more. So it's so exhausting after the event is over. But from the fundraising side, that's actually when it's all starting. OK, so making sure that before you do an event, you've got a plan and the resources that the day the event is over, you're prospecting. Essentially, it doesn't start. It started at the event. You should be thinking of prospecting at the event, but the real work ramps up. OK, it's not over. Direct email and mail. Don't forget these tactics. I do not get cute mail anymore, and I'm really bummed about that. <laughs> I'm the card lady that loves putting stuff in the mail because, and my mom is too, actually, I think I got it from her, because we don't get fun, cute mail. We don't get invitations like that. So I'm like, think about that as a strategy. And obviously email is super important, but does it stand out? Like, even if you're having a virtual event, um, sending something in the mail can really stand out and get folks excited. Social media is also super important for prospecting. Sometimes we don't see actual money coming in as in terms of fundraising from social media, but we certainly are building relationships with folks and staying top of mind so that when fundraising campaigns are happening, I might see it more likely on my Instagram uh, story if I'm following that than looking at my emails in the evening. Warm calling. Alberto talked about it. Alberto got a cold call. 
not so good. We don't do cold calling, right? Because we're where this is called relationship based selling. Um, we're doing warm calling. So taking the time to strategize, looking at lists that you already have and using referrals and other um, prospect lists and being really mindful of who you're having calling to Alberto's point. You don't want a random person that's calling. You want to have the call go to the right person with the right relationship. Okay. This takes strategy meetings and it takes a lot of organization, which is another, I think, great skill of a fundraiser is to kind of be a project manager behind the scenes. Networking is huge. Networking has not stopped. I sign up for certain workshops and virtual conferences specifically to network. It's, it's actually one of Laura and our regional strategies to make sure that we're getting the word out about what we do and all of our resources. So networking shouldn't stop. And my kind of tip that I tell most folks is I was never successful at fundraising without my peer fundraisers. And, and that's part of my circle of influence as well. Asking other fundraisers, asking other funders and having those new networks to, to kind of pull into gives you opportunities to bring in new potential prospects, volunteers, donors, and supporters. Krista, I just want to point out, um, Heidi says many funders may also look at social media to see current events, priorities, and activities of an organization before supporting them. Thank you for that, then, Heidi. And then Steven says direct marketing also includes texting, which is interesting but controversial. Uh, done right, it seems to be very effective. Yeah, I agree. Uh, these are all techniques that, you know, and, and kind of um, methods that you can utilize, but ultimately, the, I think the creative and fun part of being a fundraiser and being on a team is to figure out what's right for you and really know where your organization is. So I have seen a lot of successful texting campaigns over the last year. Think about the election is one of them, okay? A lot of fundraising went into the election, and I still get texts from certain uh, candidates or um, groups that I got involved in at the election. So it, it can work. It's just, you have to know what your investment is and, you know, kind of the strategy before, during, and after for your org. So it's not about using all of these. It's about taking these and figuring out what's right for your organization based on your goals. Organization initiated prospecting can include a lot of things, but that can often um, include either, you know, looking internally within your staff on who may uh, have relationships. Um, obviously, utilizing your board is a really critical way of bringing in new prospects to the organization. And or you might hire a third party and this happens. I see it. I've definitely been on a list that other organizations have purchased or co collaborated with because I'm getting new emails and new information from folks. But just remember that if you're using a third party, you know, how again, how warm is that in building a relationship? Right? And, and having that be a part of your strategy. So, but that prospect can really come from a lot of different ways internally if you can invest. Your website, don't forget your website. I'm gonna add your GuideStar profile. I've been working with some organizations locally that the SEO for their own website isn't as good as their GuideStar profile. So if someone's searching your organization or kind of doing a search based on what you may have on your organization and their GuideStar, your GuideStar profile comes up and you haven't claimed it and you're not using this free tool to tell your story, again, how are, how are you, um, you know, either hurting or, uh, you know, improving your chance to meet new folks that are interested in your work. And crowdfunding finally, and that can include a lot of things. And actually, if we can't find it quickly, Laura, I know we have an article on kind of different types of crowdfunding. We can't go into the details here, but this includes peer to peer campaigns. It includes um, really when I say campaign, it's kind of a comprehensive way of doing communications and asking with a timeline which I think is critical. Kind of an open crowdfunding, you know, into the sky isn't as um, impactful as we need to raise, you know, $50,000 by the end of the summer so that we can help kids with their back to school resources. And we're gonna, you know, have all of these ways for, for folks to get the word out to their peers and also to um, have their peers support their peers. And that's how crowdfunding grows, but you need a deadline. That's a really important part of the campaign. So those are some, prospecting tools, but I want to dig into and have some time for um, you to think about your circles of influence because it's a great 
method and it's an important activity to kind of leave you with. So Laura, if, if this handout works, let's drop it in there and see if folks can grab it. But I'm gonna give you some a few quiet minutes for you to think about who do you know well enough to ask to connect you to new people? Who do you need to cultivate this relationship with to um, ultimately get to what you're looking for, right? It may be a few folks away from someone. So in your personal life, it's your friends, family, and mentors. Think about your colleagues as a circle with your coworkers, your acquaintances, your associates, maybe past coworkers, um, you know, LinkedIn, right? And thinking like, I, there are folks that I worked with years ago, but because I developed such a great relationship, I could kind of LinkedIn them out of the blue and they'd probably give me a call if I needed that, right? So think through that with colleagues, businesses, brands, right? Location and space, maybe if you need to host something. Um, In-kind donations, not always asking directly for money, but how can you get businesses in engaged in your work, volunteering? And then civic peers, right? Other friends in leadership. Um, I I've always been a, kind of a little in engaged in my civic um duty. I'm, I'm involved in a, a, in a local community board. I like being a part of our local city council elections. So, um, and I know that for fundraising that helps because there's city money. And frankly, I know here in San Diego, there's a lot of county money. Our county supervisors are being super generous right now. And those are new forms of fundraising and dollars to help your organization. So having a kind of civic mind to your circle of influence is also important to help in fundraising. So I'm going to stop talking. Did the okay. handout work? Are we getting it? Yes, yes. no? Yes? Awesome. Yay, I love that. I'm glad we tried the Google Docs this time and I'm glad it worked. So I'm going to give you a few quiet moments to just brainstorm, use the handout, use this slide and write down who do you know well enough to ask to connect you to new people, folks that you think would be really interested in your cause or in your organization? We're not talking about asking them for anything right now. We're talking about asking to be connected, to grow your circle of influence. So I'll give you a few quiet minutes to brainstorm. Okay, continue to brainstorm, but I'd love to hear in the chat or if you're motivated to share um, by unmuting briefly, where are some other areas and folks that you know that could potentially help connect you and expand your circle of influence? What you come up with? Um, existing volunteers, says Laura. Yes. I love that one. I think we forget that sometimes. Mm -hmm. 
It's so powerful. They're already volunteering. They already know your organization. They could absolutely connect you with new folks because they have their own story to tell about why they're volunteering. And Diane says we might try connecting to our hospital's auxiliary. Love that. So important. Such a great idea. Don't forget your kind of internal groups. And that might even start with just your colleague that oversees the auxiliary, right? Um, which can even be a warmer call than going right to the head of the auxiliary, depending on how it's form formed. What else? And I'm going to add too for volunteers, don't forget your board. So if you don't have a direct relationship with your board members, it's a, certainly a great tip to provide your CEO or your executive director to kind of have this same conversation. This is always like, we're doing this with you, but again, you can bring this to your board or to your staff and think about them doing an activity like this to help expand everyone's circle. And it looks like uh, Diane read your mind or you read hers. Uh, she <laughs> says, asking our board to suggest family, friends, colleagues who'd like yes. to do Yes, yes, so it's different than just, Open up your Rolodex and give us people with money. Okay, it's getting your board and your your volunteers involved in um, also bringing new folks to your organization. Right, we're going to talk about then what to do with it, but these are really great steps in doing that. I also, I think I shared this. I've been going to conferences. Like I just wrote down here um, that I, I'm going to go to this AFP workshop, our local San Diego AFP workshop to learn about the Giving USA numbers, but I'm going to network with my colleagues too. I want my colleagues to all know that I work at Candid, I'm still working at Candid, and I wanna share with them what we do at Candid because in some ways, I guess I'm always a fundraiser. <laughs> <laughs> it never stops, Krista. It, it never, never stops. stops. Um, but like, I, you know, I, 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 I'm doing some of those to be strategic and keeping myself up to date, but also to really network. And Stephen says, identify people that are opinion leaders, very social, et cetera. Ask them to identify or introduce you to people that might be interested. Tracy says, your church or your faith community. Uh, Susan yes. says, we have a difficult time just to get our board to help out. Yeah, and members as well. There are only a few, so we're hoping to learn from you. Good. Well, yeah. Getting some other suggestions. On I hope you're getting some suggestions. Laura teaches this great workshop on your, it's called your board and fundraising that kind of goes more into detail on board. So we're giving you some overviews today, but we'll certainly send you some more. I think there's even a knowledge um, article, Laura, yeah. that has more board tips. So we'll certainly just provide you with some more resources. This is a tough one. If, if it's hard doing it with your board now, sometimes actually having a third party come in and do some strategic conversations with the board um, is a good solution because um, we understand we, we, we're with you. The only other way that I've had influence on helping to, to support the board when I haven't, it, what hasn't been my job, like it's usually the CEO or the executive director's job to do that um, is because I'm expanding my circle of influence as a fundraiser all the time, I'm thinking about good board prospects. So that's another way to help your board is to bring in some new fresh board members that understand in the beginning of their relationship that fundraising is a part of their role and responsibilities. And then they model that for the other board members. But again, this takes time. So think about who some good board prospects might be and you can kind of uh, share some of those relationships up to whoever's managing the board. Connecting with your colleagues, yes. Okay, we'll start thinking about that. Take the handout with you. Do these activities internal. Don't stop. Don't do like, oh, okay, well, I, I brainstormed about my circle of influence in June, so we're good. This is something, and I'll be honest with you, because now that I'm reflecting on myself, I think about how I'm going to build my circle of influence on probably a weekly basis. It's always on my top of mind on how I can be like thinking about bringing new folks in or who can... Uh, oh, you know what? My my colleague Hannah, she's up in um, LA. She actually might know a really great capacity builder in LA. I know that we want to do more programs for Los Angeles. So always kind of thinking about you know who who that person is that might be able to connect you when the time is right, and and keeping those relationships strong today. So let's move into pre-approach. It's really the planning and preparation done. Um, prior to contacting the prospects. So we're not really there yet. It, of course, all of these 
um, steps aren't, aren't just linear. They might, you might prospect and then you'll go back to pre-approach and then from pre-approach you might go back to prospecting. They're, they're here as tools, but the idea is we haven't really cool. even connected or contacted the person yet. We want some strategies around that. So here's a checklist for, for you to um, consider, moving this over, who drives the philanthropic uh, decisions? Can you do some research on this in advance? Any, any amount of research you can do, especially for any funder, on um, what they do. That's another reason why we have Foundation Directory Online for foundations. Like, you should be doing this research before you apply. But the same thing for donors. Who drives the philanthropic decisions in the family? Is it the wife? Is it the husband? Is it the children? Is there someone that runs the family foundation? Really understanding that will help you know how to approach them. Um, and giving history with your organization. Have they given to your organization before? Chances are you have some really great prospects that have given to you, but they haven't given or you haven't asked um, and or giving history with other organizations. If you see that they're giving to another organization that has you know, similar work or shared values, just doing as much research as you can about that. Um, also, personal interests. This is why LinkedIn and, as Heidi said, social media and all these other kind of online tools that we have to learn a little bit more about folks in advance really important it's it's it it's not creepy <laughs> they appreciate it okay folks appreciate this information we actually just had a program a couple weeks ago where laura interviewed a really prominent philanthropist in the bay area and it makes me happy to say that like she validated all of these just recently um she wants you to know what her interests are and if you're not sure she wants you to ask and kind of do that research before taking the time um if if that's not an area that they're interested in okay so seeing where else they give is important also understanding their passions and priorities you can see it from where they're giving what other events they're going to um, it's another way you can prospect like if your fundraising friend knows that you're trying to get in touch with ex philanthropist and they're attending your virtual their virtual event, go to that virtual event, <laughs> see what they're saying. Um, attend grant maker panels. We we have one that we're doing for the Bay Area um, later this week that Laura's organizing. But like get see as often as you can hear from them and and understand what their passions and priorities are because they can shift. Um, other charitable work and giving, are they on boards? Have they served on committees? And obviously their connections. So you might be like, I don't know how to, I can do so much research on Google and I don't know how to get all of this information. Well, that's another reason why this checklist is so helpful when we move into actual needs discovery and reaching out to them. This helps you craft the questions that you're going to ask them so that you can learn this information before just diving in and asking them for a million dollars. So here are some uh, information sources for this information. Yes, you have to ask other people. Sometimes that relationship building and learning about people is asking other people about them. Um, it's usually the primary way that I find out this information about other donors. Um, but obviously current donors might have information on folks um, or other prospects. So again, if you don't feel like you can contact your current donors to ask them this stuff, then looking at how strong your relationships with your current donors are is probably a priority. Board members, like we talked about, and this is either print or kind of online magazines, right? There's always a, a some sort of publication in every community, I think, around like donor <laughs> event coverage, a philanthropy page, you know, yes, socialite magazines, and kind of, I can tell you there are some zip codes in San Diego where more of these programs and events happen. So like, I know that, you know, if I was gonna be curious about what's going on, I would go to Del, Ma Del Mar Papers and Rancho Santa Fe first, um, before I kind of look in some of the communities that I live in, just to see what they're up to. Civic groups, you know where these resources are. Um, and obviously online resources, I've got some here for you. You can see on guide star who's involved um we you can look on linkedin you can use um zillow for real estate this e-tapestry lookup oops link i was trying to highlight it oh krista um is a really great way to kind of look up wealth there are wealth screenings there's a program called uh, donor search that is a fee-based program but that can give you more information 
Um, so yeah, the FEC gives you political contributions to help you understand where their values are in some ways. So use as much information um, that's out there. There's probably even, uh, please, if you have some other online resources, drop them in the chat. So really getting um, clear on how you're doing your research and really spending the time. There's jobs, some of you, I don't know if you have it, but there's jobs just for prospect researcher. And that's their job, um, to have uh, access to a lot of these different tools and to do this work. So it's a really important role if you don't have a full-time person doing that, to dedicate a certain amount of your time to that for this process. And then the approach. Um, speaking and sounding out your prospect for the first time. And, and we say that thinking like it's a new person, but there's also a kind of reapproach with donors that either if you're new to an organization and they're giving, but you haven't had an actual approach with them, um, that is still kind of new to you and them. Um, and or if a donor hasn't been giving in a while, then you need a whole, they have to kind of start the cycle over um, and reintroduce yourself and the donor, like, like it's the first time, but with some background knowledge, of course. So you can use this approach step for folks that you know or folks that you don't. Um, there are um, some types of approaches here. A relevant benefit is when you know the issues um, that there, that are interest to them by doing some research, right? Um, if, and obviously this comes with, you know, knowing them more, the more, you know, the, of them, the more, you know, what of, is of interest to them. Um, and that will help you really uh, figure out what your approach is. I always had a few donors that I knew were really interested in a part of our work. They loved all of our work, but they were, I, for example, I would have this PhD at one of my organizations. And she really liked that we were like measuring our education programs and was really interested in the kind of research side of our work, not necessarily like the the program with the, that served the kids. So I always knew that every time we had research meetings or retreats or reports that like that was something that I would immediately think to send to her and engage her in because I knew that she had shared with me that that was what she was interested in. Impact. Obviously, when you know what motivates the donor to give, you can include them. I mean, you should be having some sort of regular communication with all donors on your impact. But if this is a particularly of interest to folks, especially the larger their gift goes, I mean, what is the impact of the $10,000 that they gave? How did that help, you know, uh, the organization and the cause. Curiosity is a huge one. I hope you take this away with you today. When you know something personal about the prospect, especially hot button issues, having curiosity for them, um, and engaging them, and also finding opportunities to ask them for advice. That was the other uh, piece of advice that our philanthropist gave us, right, Laura? Is that like, if the time is right and you have a relationship, asking them for advice is so spot on because they are such great resources and they're going to then think of others to refer you to because you're asking them for advice on certain issues. So including donors in, in your care, you being curious about them and then including them and in being curious about you and engaging them in your work is so important. I, I Sometimes it's funny that we have to say this, but complimenting is an approach. Complimenting, thanking, gratitude. It's the approach that works for me all the time. If you're sitting here going, I don't really know how to reach out to these folks. I barely know them. Thank them. Compliment them. It signals honest interest in the prospect. Uh, obviously, it needs to be sincere, specific, and genuine. But it's another great way or tactic um, to get your board involved, too. How can your board thank and compliment your existing donors? Or if it's someone new, complimenting them. Um, I don't know if it's like a retail tip that I always learned, but it's it's authentic to me. I'm like, I'm, I love, you know, fashion and hair and things like that. So it's very easy for me to be like, oh my God, I love those earrings. That is, they're so great. Like these are great ways to kind of open and start approaching an, a, a situation and then complimenting them on their work. I saw that you've been giving to this organization for the last 10 years. Can you tell me a little bit more about the work that you're doing with them? Um, it's really impressive that you've been such a great supporter. So thinking about different layers of compliments. Referrals, we've talked about what it does as an approach is it borrows the influence of this person and it essentially grows trust and respect, right? Um, so you 
obviously need a relationship with them, but starting to think about how you might use referrals as an approach for someone that you know or you're growing a relationship with. Sometimes you'll get no's too. You'll just, you'll be moving along with the prospect and it's just not the right fit for either of you. And a referral is another great deal. Well, you know, if you can think of anyone that you think would be really interested in our work, we'd love for you to share this. Okay. And education demonstrates the knowledge and expertise that they have. Again, back to advice. Like if your potential prospect has a specific expertise that serves your organization, a great first approach. You know, we're doing this campaign or we're restructuring how we're offering our programs. And I was wondering if you'd have X amount of time to kind of talk to me a little bit about, you know, your advice and what you've seen has worked in the, this space, thinking about their expertise. Um, and finally, I think this is the last one, hands-on. This is really about appealing to numerous senses. This is getting, like, if they're obviously volunteers, like someone said, they uh, they love getting hands-on and involved in the work. Um, for example, I've been involved in a community garden um, program here locally, and I've been giving philanthropic advice, but I got to be honest, I really just kind of want to go dig in the dirt. <laughs> it's another interest of mine. So, of course, I can give them fundraising advice, but... I'm, I'm just actually hoping that they'll invite me to come and volunteer for the day and, and, and dig in the dirt because that's something that hopefully will help them, but is really something that um, is uh, something that I enjoy. Okay. Um, that takes a little while to know, but um, that's me as a brand new prospect just kind of wanting to dig in the dirt <laughs> and grow some vegetables. So remember, you only get that first impression. And obviously, we could talk about tactics if you know something doesn't go as well. How do you kind of change the tune? Um, but really taking the time to be strategic with how you're approaching folks and taking the time to build the relationship before you do that cold call that Alberto got is so worth it because they they might have an impression and remember how kind of off-putting that first impression might have been. So um, it's not about that you can't correct it. It's more about a reminder to take the time. Okay, speaking of time, um, how are we on time, Laura? I want to pause here before I get into this case study and just see if we have any questions because we don't have to dive into the case study. I feel like I've been talking a lot. So questions about what we just talked about or a scenario that maybe we can give you a more tailored um, answer on? Um, and if you're not speaking, um, please please mute your uh, your speak your phone. I hear a little background noise. Yeah, it's somebody. Okay, I'm seeing um, something in the chat here. Yes, donor screening tools are available for a cost, um, but they can provide um, important information. I completely agree, uh, Steve, and thank you so much for saying that. There's donor search and wealth engine, and probably others out there these days. Again, don't just go buy it thinking that you're going to like find the millionaire that's going to give you money. It's part of a strategy and it should be built into a budget as you're growing your individual program. Okay. Links to donor research sites. Um, there it's called donor search and donor wealth or sorry and wealth engine wealth donor engine. search and wealth engine. I think you could Google it. Yeah, there we don't have like a a formal partnership with them. I'm not like endorsing any of that. So it's not really included in our kind of, you know, regular materials, but it exists. So that's and, the- And I have heard of organizations coming together and pitching in for the cost, like-minded organizations. Um, the board that I'm on is a nonprofit theater and we actually share space with meant with several other nonprofit theaters. So um, at one point we talked about coming together and getting a subscription um, at that point, it was for razor's edge, but um, you know, it's obviously you, you don't want to share sensitive information, but wealth engine um, for doing research. Uh, I think, you know, something like that we could certainly get behind. It's not cheap. Yeah. It's the only problem. <laughs> no, no. And, and it's, and you're right. I think pooling resources with other organizations or asking for a free trial to see if it's something that even fits what your strategy is. Um, larger shops have it. So having a colleague at a larger shop to see if you can like, you know, again, test it out. But, um, you know, if, if, if some of the basic kind of steps in prospecting and developing relationships aren't there, this is not gonna save the individual giving program. It just provides you more information to do more research to me human connection 
is a is a easy way to get the information that you need um, and and kind of grow your program to be able to have those resources. So I'm I definitely don't I've never worked for an organization that could afford that, and we raised lots of money and did a great job. What we invested in is people fundraisers. Okay, um, so yes. Great tools, certainly not endorsing it. It's more about developing your skills as a fundraiser to develop these relationships. Um, Krista, we do have about, let's see, we have 10 minutes left, um, but we could spend a few minutes uh, on the case study. It's up to you, uh, either that or we could talk Look about it. it. Okay, good. I just have to pause so that, you know, if we did have any burning questions, Here's a case study and we can kind of look at it as a scenario for the first few steps that we talked about. So your longtime donor um, is bringing a couple from her neighborhood to your next donor reception and read this as a virtual one because like, like I said, I've been to some of them or I do know that folks are having smaller outdoor socially distant donor receptions. Um, the couple is well known for their philanthropy. Your donor, who's bringing them, is hesitant about bringing this couple because she says they get asked by nonprofits all the time and she doesn't want them to feel uncomfortable. Ultimately, your donor decides, given your impact this year, that now is the right time. So let's strategize. Let's have a discussion in chat. Like, what's next? What do you do? What are some thoughts that you have? Um, maybe experts in the room pause and let's see if folks that are new to fundraising have some ideas that we can kind of layer in and, and add to after some of our new folks. Actually, we have an opportunity to unmute if you'd like as well. Um, Steven says, I do not ever ask for donations at events. It is the follow up that counts 100%. Um, I agree. Ashley says, Treat them like people, not ATMs. <laughs> Yes, I love that. Um, and I will say this is really, this is called the donor reception. So I probably should have qualified that it's not like a gala. So there are certain events um, and Stephen, maybe, you know, chime in on what you think. There are certain events that it's like, this is our annual fundraiser. This is when, you know, when you buy a ticket and when you buy an auction item and when you, you know, give a cash gift. Um, to fund the cause, it helps our organization. It's very clear that this is a fundraiser and we're going to ask you for money. When you have donor receptions and ways to thank your donors and to keep them involved in, in the organization, I call I kind of call those like stewardship events. And we're going to talk about stewardship next week and some strategies there. Um, it's not always an, uh, the best place to ask for money. So really thinking through your events, like Steven said, and making sure that you have a variety of events um, and being strategic and not a... <laughs> And not asking. I'm remembering some work I did with the theater where I had to like remind them. Nobody asked them for money. Like I had to like remind them to not ask for money because they were such good fundraisers. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't want this is a friend raising, right? Instead of fundraising, sometimes we call it friend raising. Yes, absolutely. So being very intentional and specific with everyone that's a part of the event and knowing what the kind of goal and purpose is. Treat and them like people not even. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mentioned that one. And then Anurada says, get to know them and what interests them. Absolutely. Yeah. So if they're coming to your event and um, whether it's online or um, in person, um, dedicating someone to um, interact with them, I think is like kind of top of mind for me in this case study when I think about it. Like, you know, there should be a strategy on the team from the organization. Is it me or you, the top fundraiser? Is there a board member involved? Obviously, your other donor is bringing them. So um, they should be part of this kind of approach, uh, a strategy, pre-approach and approach strategy, getting as much information that you can in advance from this donor and others about them. Um, and yeah, maybe I would... I would try to have some one on one time with them um, beyond just having them come to the event. Um, so that takes some planning because I've done events for so long. I always, even when I had large events, I would assign kind of volunteers and different staff members. Okay, here are the three people that I want you to go over, you know, have a conversation with, introduce yourself, talk a little bit about why you serve on the board and why this mission is important to you and kind of have some personal connection time. Um, so being creative and think about kind of who that is at the event and like what they're going to talk about, right? And kind of prepping them. Yes, somebody in chat just read your mind. Uh, introduce your CEO, 
Introduce your CEO and ask other board members to share their experiences with your organization. Love it. And then what else? Like, what are some other things that could either happen at the event or maybe even kind of like follow up? They they come, they have a fab time. That's it. Thanks. They came. Woohoo! Maybe they'll send us a check one day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have about five minutes left, Krista. Okay. Thanks, Laura. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And need discovery. Oh. Maybe we'll cover this next week then. Thanks, Laura. Yeah. Let's the most important thing is when we start really having the needs discovery, um, we get into really critical questions and understanding, you know, their heart. Um, okay, Krista. Hold on a second here. Um, let's cover this one. Need discovery tips. Oh, no. Where's my other slide, Laura? Sorry. Questions. Oh, oh no, we, we have time. What were you saying? I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you, you told me five minutes and I didn't want to wrap it up too quickly. Um, oh, yeah. No, then um, I'm sorry, folks. I, I skipped ahead. Let's go over. We'll go over the detail of needs discovery next week, and we'll make sure to also talk about your stewardship plan with folks as well. Um, this is the slide that you wanted, right, Laura? And then we'll hand yeah. it back over to Heidi. <laughs> My apologies, folks. Yeah, not at all, Krista. And as uh, Krista said, think about your elevator pitch because next week we're going to be talking about uh, uh, your presentation, handling objections, making the ask, and then stewardship as well. So it's going to be an exciting program. Oh, yeah. And we have this slide too. Yes. And don't forget to sign up for our newsletter. I'll put the link in the chat. Okay. Sorry about that rush. You're not, you're gonna, not going to miss anything. <laughs> Heidi, we're going to hand it over to your team to um, make your final um, announcements too. And it looks like someone was asking how they can register for next week as well. Excellent. That sounds great. All right, let me go ahead and share my slides here. Uh, I do want to point out that you are able to register using the same Eventbrite link um, that you did to, to sign up for this one. So you should be able to go on using that same link and then you'll just have to select the, the day. Um, and then you'll contact our office if you're interested but having trouble uh, accessing the registration and we'll we'll make sure to get you all set up. So definitely want to uh, see you all attend and, and provide you the support you need to, to be able to access the information. And just as a reminder, a recording and presentation will be emailed out um, and will also be on our Sam and Well Care's website. Um, we'll, we're hoping to have the email sent out to you um, prob probably on Friday, maybe on, on Monday. So you'll be able to get it and you know, refresh your memory before next week's presentation. We also have a survey coming out to you. It should be in your e inbox momentarily. Um, we ask that you, you know, complete the survey, give us some, you know, any information, thoughts about your, today's webinar, any future trainings, that uh, topics that you'd like us to cover. We we really, really do value your input and we try to, you know, shape these webinars based on your feedback. So it's, it only takes a few minutes, but definitely provides us a lot of valuable information. And then, of course, we have part two next week on June 15th at 10 a.m. So next Tuesday, 10 a.m., uh, we look forward to seeing you there where we'll cover the remainder of the steps. And then in July, we'll also have a web webinar on uh, COVID safe reopening. So this is in conjunction with the San Bernardino Public Health Department covering topics about how, you know, how to bring people back to the office safely, how to you know, care for your, your clients safely, and um, hoping to, to answer some of the questions around this uh, interesting transition period where we're in, where we're starting to, to come back into uh, you know, the offices and back to our regular routines and just, you know, want to make sure we, we do it safely with and comfortably for everyone. So this one would be, will be July 20th at 1130 AM and we'll be sending an, an announcement for that with the registration link in the coming weeks. Um, 
we want to say thank you and it was so great to see you all today and to see all of your participation in the chat box with that i hope you have a wonderful day thank you all thank you